Good morning, church. Good morning, friends. It's great to see you again on this YouTube worship on this Sunday, 28th, February 2021. We have had a, a face to face worship last Sunday as we try to have it twice a month on the first and third Sundays. And uh, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to this worship this morning. The peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. And when we come to worship like this, we don't need to pretend. We come just as we are because God accepts us as we are. So friends, just come as you are. Come as you are, that's how I want you. Come as you are, feel quite at home. Close to my heart, nothing forgiven. Come as you are, why stand alone? Sets no limits, no need to fear. Love never ends. Don't run away, shamed and disheartened. Rest in my love, trust me again. To call sinners, not just the righteous. I came to bring the peace, not to condemn. Each time you fail to believe Mama promise, why do you think I'd love you the less? Let us pray. Almighty God, our Lord, we come with joy to worship you this morning. May our hearts be completely open to your entrusting ourselves to you and you only. Christ our Lord, allow us to come to you and take your yoke and put it on us and learn from you in this hour. Your love is so deep and your mercy is boundless, no matter how great our problem, no matter how great our problems, how terrible our mistakes, and how often we stum stumble and fall. Your love is so deep, and your mercy is boundless, no matter how great our problems, how terrible our mistakes, and how often we stumble and fall. Lord, in this prayer, we confess that sometimes we are sinful and are in bad shape. We confess that sometimes we are greedy. We grab for more of what we have enough of. Lord, we confess that we have been indifferent to the pain of others around us. Lord our God, forgive us our sins. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true Change my heart, oh God May I be like you Change my heart, oh God Make it ever true Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the poor, I am the clay. Oh, 
me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. May I be like you. My name is Shirley Sharpham. And today's scripture readings are from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, and Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Genesis 17, verse 1. The sign of the covenant. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abraham bowed, bowed down with his face touching the ground. And God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham because I am making you the ancestor of many nations. I will give you many descendants, and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Jesus speaks about his suffering and death. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. He made this very clear to them. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus turned around, looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. Your thoughts don't come from God, but from human nature. Then Jesus called the crowd and his disciples to him. If any of you want to come with me, he told them, you must forget yourself, carry your own cross and follow me. For if you want to save your own life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for me and for the gospel, you will save it. Do you gain anything if you win the whole world but lose your life? Of course not. There is nothing you can give to re regain your life. If you are ashamed of me and of my teaching in this godless and wicked day, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In these are the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, everybody wants to be happy. Nobody will challenge that. The pursuit of happiness is so integral to our idea of the good life. The Thomas Jefferson, the third American president, as well as the principal author of the Declaration of Independence and in America, had said many times that the pursuit of happiness is one of the primary rights of every humankind. Actually, Jefferson was a philosopher before he joined the political society in the 18th century. Well, there is another philosopher who didn't think that the pursuit of happiness was everyone's right. His name was 
Friedrich Nietzsche from Germany in the 19th century. Nietzsche saw the, more, the mere pursuit of happiness as one that actually hindered the achievements of happiness in human life. Nietzsche even ridiculed the American way of pursuing happiness by saying that mankind does not strive for happiness, only the Englishman does. It's a very interesting one. Nietzsche is also well known as his phrase that says, God is taught. It's German and means in English, God is dead. And uh, because of this, Nietzsche has been criticized and attacked by many Christian theologians across the world. Yes, it is true that he said, God is taught, God is dead. But actually, not many people know that Nietzsche maintained his Christian belief until he died in 1900 at the age of 55. What actually happened was that Nietzsche used the phrase to, to criticize the rapid developments uh, that the Age of Enlightenment brought about in Europe in the 18th century. So what he actually tried to say was this, God is dead, God remains dead because we have killed him. And also, Nietzsche was dedicated to the idea of finding a true happiness in life. And he suggested and claimed that the pursuit of finding the meaning of life, meaning in life is the one that makes us truly and lastingly happy. What an amazing statement, I think. Now, many modern psychologists agree they suggest that the key to good living is always to find the meaning, even to an extent of risking great suffering. I think this is a critically important notion of happiness because a lot of people still view happiness as being a status of no suffering and pain at all. And I have given to my servant today to the title, Life and Suffering. And in today's Genesis reading, God appeared to Abram and said he would make his covenant with Abram and give him many descendants and blessing. And this covenant was actually God's promising blessing on Abram's life. In verse 6, God told him that some of Abram's descendants would be kings. And as a final conclusion of, of God's covenant with Abram, God said, I will be your God, and I will be the God of your descendants. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. Think about it. To more simply put, we could modify it a little bit for us in this 21st century like this. I will love you and take care of you. And I will love your children and grandchildren and take care of them. Now, this is my everlasting covenant with you and your children and their children. And their children, I will be your God and the God of your descendants. And Abraham was 99 years old when this happened. So we need to go back to his life 25 years ago. Why? Because it was when God appeared to him for the first time and gave him the same covenant for the first time. It's all in there in details in the Bible. In chapter 12 of Genesis, God said to Abraham, go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And then uh, verse 4 of the same chapter describes it this way. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went, uh, went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Well, Abraham took his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot and all the wealth and all the servants they had acquired in Haran and they started out for the land of Canaan. Well, what I'm trying to say with all this about Abraham and his life in the book of Genesis 
is that his journey of pursuing God's promise was very much a life of suffering rather than a life of happiness. You know, back in Haran, his life was no risk. It was a good life. He had enjoyed a wealthy and comfortable life with his family, servants, and all his uh, possessions. And upon leaving Haran, however, his comfortable life changed almost upside down, traveling to uh, places that he had never traveled before, like uh, Shikham, Bethel, Negev, not along the powerful and dangerous place, Egypt. And if you have a closer look at his life in the coming next uh, the few chapters in the same Genesis, nearly for the rest of his life, since he and his family left Haran, he lost all his privileges, establishments, and security, often being thrown into bad to worse situations. The most likely guess is that he's, uh, been, he'd been disappointed and exhausted, and above all, in doubt. That's right, in doubt of everything, of life, of future, and even God and his promise as well. Well, that's when today's Genesis reading happened. After 25 long years since his departure from Haran, and in the middle of no hope and vision and happiness, God appeared to him again and reminded him of the very covenant that he made with Abraham a very long time ago. So to the detail of the covenants we see in chapter 17 of Genesis is almost the same with the one we saw in his chapter 12 that I mentioned before. It's like, I will make you a great nation, and I will be your God and the God of your descendants. But there is one thing I added in today's Genesis reading. And I said a covenant is kind of promise between two parties, and in today's reading, it is a promise between God and Abraham. And there are always rules of obligations involved in both parties in order for the promise to be guaranteed. God's guarantee already has been secured in his words that he will be Abraham's God and the God of his descendants. But what would be Abraham's rules of obligation in that covenant? Some might say Abraham believed God and his promise, and that's why he left his place, Haran, straight away. Yes, true. Leaving Haran was definitely part of his obligation, but not all of it. It was only the beginning of his journey to the promise. And if you are familiar with some of the stories regarding Abraham's life after Haran, you will be having a hard time because he actually had failed many times to be a man of faith. In many episodes of his life, his relationship with his wife and other people, it's very difficult to conclude that Abraham was the father of faith, as many of us know of today. For example, Sarah, Abraham's wife, was a very beautiful woman. And when they were about to cross, the border into Egypt, Abraham said to Sarah, you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will assume that you are my wife, and so they might kill me to have you. So Sarah, please tell them that you are my sister. And uh, the Egyptian king saw Sarah, and he was so attracted to her, so the king took her into his palace and then gave lots of flocks and slaves to Abraham as a trade instead. And Abraham took it and did nothing about it. And I think Abraham became the trickiest husband of all humankind history. And I believe today's Genesis reading contains something that Abraham had failed to do in his journey of seeking God's promise 
Please pay attention to what God has said. Before he said, he would make his covenant with Abraham. Verse 17 reads, When Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. And I will make covenant with you and give you many descendants. The point is, Abraham failed to obey God and failed to do always what is right. This is it. I mean, if you are honest, this is what we often forget in our life as God's children. Friends, we must admit that many of us tend to think that obeying God is kind of the thing of the past in the Old Testament. And we often talk about the theologies and ministry and mission at the expense of our ordinary life, which should be based on our obedience to God. We know and we feel the importance of obeying God through his word and teachings at events like a Bible study and Sunday worship. But we tend to forget when getting back to our everyday, ordinary life in homes, works, and in our neighborhoods. Abraham didn't get it, although he was chosen as the father of faith and the beginning of God's blessing and covenant. Friends, trying to do what is right is one thing, and trying to do what is right always is quite another. More specifically, are you willing to obey God and always do what is right, even though it causes you a suffering and pain in your life? In today's Gospel reading, Jesus speaks for the first time about his suffering and death, and it upset, it upset the disciples, especially Peter. So the reading says Peter took Jesus aside and complained. Why did he do it? Think about it. I know why. Because suffering or even death was not what the Peter signed up for. Bigger life, more success, more money, more happiness was what he came to Christ to sign up for. Look at what kinds of lives all the disciples had to face after following Christ. It was the life of suffering rather than the life of happiness. Yes, I believe our Christian journey definitely is the journey of God's blessing and happiness, but are you still willing to forget yourself, carry your cross, and follow Christ to an extent of suffering in everything you do and have in your life? True believers, real Christians, are not born but made made throughout their entire lives. Friends in Christ, are you still willing to sacrifice your own happiness and your well-being and obey to God no matter what happens? Are you willing to always do what is right before God even though it causes you suffering and pain along the way? Remember again, God never breaks his promise with us. So, let us not break it either. Obey to God and always do what is right. Amen. Well, in this prayer of the people for the world, I'd like us to pray our own individual prayers in words or in silence, respectively. And the prayer will be led into the Lord's Prayer together later. So, let us bow our heads before God in prayer. Lord our God, we have prayed for your world, for your churches across the world, for our families and friends, and for those who need our prayers. May your love and grace be always upon them forever. 
for Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue to pray in the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. May God the Father lead your journey. May Jesus the Son walk with you at your footsteps. May the Spirit of life strengthen your body, mind, and your spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and your loved ones and give you peace today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.